Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to attempt to do something. I'm going to attempt to take your humanity and destroy it. <laughs> when we're talking about worldview, we're actually talking about God's worldview, as far as we can understand it. And our place in this world is very important. In one sense, God created the universe in order to bring about a bride for Christ. Humans are very important in the scheme of things. But as far as the physical world is concerned, when we start talking about the nature of reality, things get very weird very fast. And that's what we're going to try to dive into. I'm going to try to give you like a three-point sermon, three big ideas. One, science depends upon philosophy. As we're talking to people, as we're trying to figure things out for ourselves, we have to understand science and philosophy are inextricably intertwined. You cannot separate them. The secularist doesn't want you to know that. They want to pretend that science is just facts. It's not the way it works. Second thing I want to impress upon you is that there is more that we don't know than we do know. Probably half of what we think is true isn't, scientifically. We just don't know what half is not true yet. But not only that, there are things we use every day. Gravity, light, electromagnetism. We have no idea what those things are. They make no sense. Light is made of photons, or is it a wave, or a particle, or a wave. Well, it depends on which experiment, it depends on if you cross your eyes or look at it straight. That's nonsensical, and it's the fundamental fabric of the universe. We have no clue what we're dealing with. Third, after we consider what we can know and how we can know it, it is absolutely reasonable to trust the Bible. But first, we have to strip away all the humanity because people, being full of ourselves, we think we know what we're talking about. And we actually know very, very little. All right, you happy about that so far? So let me ask you the question, how do you know what you know? How do you know anything? How do you know you're awake right now? How do you know I'm not a robot? How do you know God didn't create the universe yesterday and fill your mind with false memories? You can't. You cannot know those things. We don't believe those things. But using our brains, it's obvious that there's no, it's not like, like there's a glitch in the matrix every once in a while, right? That, that doesn't happen. Reality is reality. There's no reason to question it. This, this is real. And we know that best we can because we use our minds. We thought, we remember, we process information. There's no giant conflict. It's not like we're trying to hide the velociraptor standing behind the, the organ over there. Right? That's not true. There's not this giant break in our mind. But when we're trying to learn things, you'll remember what school's like. Some of you are in school right now. What's school like? It's like drinking from a fire hose, right? You're learning, 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 and there's too much. And you remember all this stuff for tests, and it takes tests to forget it for the rest of your life. You'll never even remember that stuff again. There's too much information, right? Well, one of the big problems in the modern world is that there's a lot of misinformation. And because we're being hit with so much information so quickly, it's very difficult to know what's true and what's not true. Especially when you're in middle school, it takes you decades to think through some of that stuff you want. You learn it, you memorize it, you pass the test, hopefully. Even worse than that, there's so many scientists especially people in government, people in religion, they talk very confidently. But they're talking foolishness, nonsense. But who are we to know? We're not an expert in all things, right? I mean, are you, can you prove Carl Sagan's wrong about astronomy, and Neil deGrasse Tyson's wrong about astronomy, and Bill Gates is wrong about uh, how Microsoft works, and the president is wrong about foreign relations, and no, you can't. We have limited knowledge. There are authority figures in our lives that are telling us things that we cannot possibly know if it's true or false. How do you actually know what you know? What a cool question. It is the worst part. In the modern world, 
Two people go on Google and they type in the same exact question, they get different search results. Why? Because Google is anticipating you. They think they know you. Oh, you're a middle-aged white man with kids, you live in the South, you're gonna get a different response than a African-American woman living in Portland with the same exact question because they pigeonhole you. Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, pick a platform, it doesn't matter. They're giving you information that you want to hear because if they give you information you don't want to hear, you leave and go to a different platform. So the modern world, we've been subdivided and categorized and we don't tend to talk outside of our little information world. And we're seeing it happen. Our society is getting more polarized over time. We don't exchange ideas anymore. So how do you know anything? What a great question. Oh, sorry. Last one. Consider also what we cannot know until we die. We're on this side of heaven, not the other side. We cannot know until we see it face to face what the other side is actually like. First Corinthians 13, 12. I'm using the King James here because I just love the poetic expression, glass darkly. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. So here Paul's saying, God knows me. I kind of know God. God sees me. I, I think Paul's given a greater window than most of us. He saw more of heaven than I'm ever going to see, I think. And yet he's saying he's seen through a glass, dark room. Modern translation is uh, through a mirror dimly. We only see a little bit of the heavenly realms. And that little bit is enough to propel the faith of a Christian to the point of persecution and death. That's glorious and amazing. But it's just a little bit. We don't know what heaven's like. You ever read um, C.S. Lewis's, um, uh, oh, what is that book? Divorce. Screw tape letters? What? Screw tape letters? No, it's when, it's when he says that when people go to heaven, just consider that they're going to um, be, be in, a, in a holding place and they can get on a bus and go to heaven if they want. And even people, to so get a second chance, they're still not going to go. But people don't like to walk on the grass because the grass hurts. This is a great divorce. What he's saying is, heaven could be more real than this. More solid, more substantial. Not ethereal clouds, more physical, because we're only in this partial physical. We don't, we don't know the other side. The secularists, they also have these giant questions. They know it. Look at this. Um, New Scientist magazine, November 2021. They ask the question, why? And they ask things like, do he exist? Are we rational? Is there a speed of light? Does evolution happen? That's the assumption there that evolution actually happens. Why are we conscious? <laughs> no one has answers to those questions. So when we're talking to someone on the street, this person is a total atheist, and they're, they're fighting back with us, um, we are challenging. <coughs> In certain ways, we're asking them to open up a closet where all the secrets are hidden, and there's a lot of scary things in that closet. Because once that door is opened, all the unanswered questions are staring in the face. And one of those questions is, does God exist? So one reason people resist the gospel strongly is because they do not want to entertain the questions that might challenge what they're trying to hide. I wrote an article for Creation Magazine a couple years ago. I called it, We Are Less Than Dust. It's one of my favorite things I've ever written. A lot of little things in there. I, I compared the size of an atom to our solar system. So take the nucleus of a hydrogen atom and expand it to the size of the sun. How far away are the electrons? About 30 times further away than Pluto. And electrons have essentially no size. So you have this tiny little dot of a nucleus 
in this vast expanse of nothingness. If you're to make a molecule, you want to take two nu nuclei and let them share a couple of electrons, they're going to be about 60 times further apart than Pluto is from the sun, and in between, there's nothing. If our sun right now, when we look at the sun, it's about half a degree in width. At that distance, the sun would be less than one one thousandth of a degree in width. Tiny little point and a tiny little point with nothing in between. That's what you're made of. Your, your body, your precious body, is something like 99.9999999, I kind of lost there. Emptiness. You are a vapor. You're a collection of molecules that exist for a little while that can relate to God. And that's going to disappear one day. Does it humble you? Does that scare you? Does that make you say, I don't like this talk anymore? Nihilism is something that very few atheists will admit to. But to drive someone towards nihilism is really scary. So occasionally in conversation, I have this dream conversation in my mind. It never actually has happened. I have this dream conversation where every time someone says something important, I say, so what? Oh, but global warming, so what? The polar bears will die, so what? Oh, but, but, so what? Nothing matters. There's no meaning to your pitiful existence. You're an accident. That's hard, isn't it? But it's true in their worldview. Not ours. Oh no, you see, I have an antidote for that. God created you. God loves you. You have a place in God's created order. I mean, how amazing is that? You're not an accident. Genesis 3.19. Part of the curse. Adam rebels against God. God says to Adam, For you are dust, and to dust you shall be returned. That is the worth of humans. In fact, um, if you took a human body and boiled off all the water and burned off all the carbon, you'd be left with a couple dollars worth of minerals. That's how much you're worth physically in the world economy. But we're infinitely valuable to the creator that created us. And in a scientific way, humans are nothing. But in the kingdom of God, we are created a little lower than the angels. Or consider um, in Ephesians when it says that the um, the interactions of the local church is making an exclamation point to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. What? Consider that angels cannot be saved if they rebel against God. <clears throat> when the angel sins, boom, there's no hope of salvation for an angel. Angels are incredibly powerful beings. We're not. We can be saved. I'm going to run out of time. I have too many illustrations. I already, that was supposed to be about five minutes. I'm like 20 already. Just because it's me. So let me ask you a question. We're going to skip over the thing I asked you earlier. Not a lot of people, so just no one. All right. What is evolution? Can someone define evolution for me? I don't know. Micro, macro? Is it hard to define evolution? Why? Come on now, what is it? No, it's not. Um, uh, well, we are taught every high school temp chemistry, I'm sorry, every high school biology textbook, I used to be a high school biology teacher, uh, most of my college textbooks, they define evolution, evolution just changed over time. Is it true? Yes and no. The word means unfolding. Changing over time. Okay, but that's not what an evolution means when he says the word evolution. When he says evolution, he's saying, I believe that enough change over enough time leads in the right direction to explain the common ancestry of all things. If you don't have the phrase common ancestry in your definition of evolution, you're not talking straight. Because I believe in change over time. I believe that my God created in his organisms the ability to adapt and change over time. And it's a good thing he did because the environment has changed a lot since creation. Most species are going to be dead. 
But our brilliant engineer, God, made it so that wouldn't happen. And what if the change is downhill? What if it goes backward? What if it goes in a circle? Change over time is insufficient until you add an assumption of history. That assumption, let me say it this way. Um, I have a PhD. What does that stand for? Yeah, Pile higher and deeper. No, no. What does PhD stand for? The Latin phrase? Does nobody know? Someone knows. No one's brave. Who's not brave enough to answer my, my questions? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> PhD stands for Doctorate in Philosophy. What philosophy? What is the philosophy that undergirded all of my training? Georgia Tech, University of Miami, more years of college than any human being should be subjected to. What was the philosophy? It's a philosophy called naturalism. Well, an ism is a belief, right? Naturalism is a belief in nature. It's a belief that nature is all there is. And the way it works out in the laboratory is nature is all you're allowed to use to explain scientific observations. But if you take biology, the study of living things, I'm a biologist, and you add the philosophy of naturalism, you will get evolution in some form. Always. If you take the study of biology and add the philosophy of theism, a belief in God, you will get some form of creation. Now there's different beliefs in creation, there's you know, old earth creation, evolutionary creation, day age, all. If you were to pigeonhole me and ask me you know, who I am, what label you could put on me, you would call me a young earth creationist. Biblical creationist, if you like. It's, I'm looking at scripture, I read scripture, I can see how old the earth is according to scripture, with you know, give or take a few decades or so. Because there's a couple of places where it's not exactly to the year. But given that, the universe, the entire universe is a little more than 6,000 years old according to the Bible. Does that embarrass you? It embarrassed me for a long time. I was terrified of that. I knew what my science friends and teachers were saying. I knew what the Bible said. I didn't want to believe the Bible. It took a long time to disentangle and understand that pronouncements from science that contradicts scripture are almost always, always in some way, based on philosophy. We're not arguing with the boiling point of water. We're not arguing with the force of gravity. We're arguing over if a stumpy leg of fish crawled out of the uh, ocean 300 million years ago on its way to evolve into Japan and the people. That, that's what we're arguing over. But those are historical questions that no one was ever there to see. Science as far as laboratory science, can't address those types of questions. So, computer volume here. I want to guide you through something. Let's look at how a simple protein is manufactured inside you. I know the sounds are good there. Is it not going well? I don't know. If it's going to oh. HDMI to VGA, so the sound goes off. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't want this sound. Okay. Okay, all right. Sorry, sorry. I'm gonna have to. Let's go back here. There we go. Let's go through how a simple protein is manufactured in your body. Thank you. Paying attention. That thing right there is called a nucleotide. It's a letter in DNA. It's four letters in DNA. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Those are chemicals, A, C, G, and T is the short end. Well, we string them together, your body strings them together, this is this famous double helix shape. Now we're going to take a section only called a gene. We're going to use this machine here called a ribosome, which opens up the DNA, makes a copy of only one strand, but every time it finds a T, it swaps it out for a U. So in this new molecule called RNA, we have A, C, G, and U, uracil. Now we're way oversimplifying this. This is so utterly complicated, we could not possibly diagram this. And you, uh, your genes are cut and spliced and rearranged. We're skipping over that part. But now let's take that and turn into a protein. We're going to go use these little adapters. They're called transfer RNAs. At the bottom of the transfer RNA, there's a three-letter code that sticks to three letters in the other RNA. And they go into this machine called a ribosome that does that. 
Imagine that if everyone makes a mistake, it can back up. What? And at the top of these transfer RNAs are amino acids. They pop off and they get strung together into something called protein. But most proteins, if left in the cells, will just, it's like a, a coiled spring, they're boing, and they get, they get ruined. They need help being folded properly. So these other proteins, called chaperones, they glom onto that unfolded strand and they don't let it fold. They bring it to another molecule called a chaperonin. We don't know how this works. We know it's hollow, we know it's shaped like a football. We know the protein goes in one end. We know that if it folds incorrectly, the chaperonin will chop it up and recycle the parts. By the way, uh, this is multiple Nobel Prizes I'm showing you here. Billions of research dollars, many uh, doctoral dissertations to figure this stuff out. But in the end, this machine will pop out a fully folded protein that works in four dimensions. It has a three-dimensional shape. Most proteins change shape to do work. It means it changes in the fourth dimension, which is time. But that's a 20-letter language. There's 20 there, actually, there's 21 amino acids in the human body. 21 amino acids in four dimensions. And it started off with a four-letter, one-dimensional string. So to make protein, we have to go through multiple levels of translation, multiple physical differences. In fact, you can't look at this protein and look at the, the, what this protein does. It has zero to do with the chemistry of ACG and T. There's no relation between these things. There's a huge level of abstraction. And if that protein was part of, let's say, a ribosome, and this protein was part of the um, uh, the DNA polymerase, or, or the other dozens of accessory proteins that we didn't illustrate that are necessary for this to work. If that protein has to be manufactured in the system that requires a protein to work, what came first? The system or the protein? The code for the protein? Or the ability to manufacture the protein? There's a giant chicken and egg problems here. And we run into those all over the place in biology. You need a you need a system, or life doesn't exist. But systems, complex systems, don't arise from scratch from random parts. Consider Psalm 92.4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, the works of your hands I sing for joy. When I saw that video the first time, I was like, this is amazing. There have been multiple times in my scientific career where I learned something, and I, God, you did this. This is amazing. There's been times where I've worked like a dog doing all the science and getting all this stuff and I finally got a chart, I'm looking at this chart and the line on the, on the screen and suddenly it dawned on me. God hid that at the creation of the world and he let me discover it. Instead of making me full of myself, which granted I am often, he brought me to my knees in reverence and awe for my creator. Because science should be a magisterial endeavor. It should make us rejoice in our creator. And yet most people use science as a crutch to reject that creator. There's a reason for that. One reason for that is there's multiple forms of science. Science as a word is kind of hard to define. What, what, how do you define, you define evolution? How do we define science? But let me do two different possible definitions, maybe even three, of science. First definition, I'm going to use a phrase called operational. It's figuring out how things work, how they operate. It deals with observing and testing and repeating experiments today. It's the type of science you learned in eighth grade. And it's the type of science that led to the development of all of our modern technologies, including this nuclear power rover that NASA flies around Mars. Round soldiers and browser on Mars. But this type of science is pioneered by Christians. You ever struggle in science class? Remember those horrible formulas you had to learn? A lot of those formulas have Greek letters, right? Well, get rid of the Greek letters and what's left? Most of the letters that are left, the letters in our alphabet, are the initials of a Christian's name. Because Christians laid down the 
roots of modern science. The rationale, the, the data, the way of thinking. Men like, you, men like Johann Kepler was a lovely, wonderful Christian testimony. He's <coughs> fleeing the Catholic Protestant wars are happening in his lifetime, and he's, he's trying to keep his data and, and write about the laws of planetary motion, which he finally figures out. And he said his, his work was like thinking God's thoughts after him. It wasn't just Kepler, though. All sorts of, of early scientists that, that are the founders of, I mean, basically every field of science except evolutionary biology, which is pretty late in the, in the world of science. But great, given that science starts off the very Christian root, what happened? What happened? Well, the philosophers got involved. Starting in the late 1600s, 1700s, and what they're doing is they're trying to build a world that didn't require a god. And it was not easy to do, because the world sure runs like a clock. It sure looks like it was built. It sure looks like it's highly organized and optimized. So what do you do? Well, well science has laws. And you start there. But the Christian said, no, the reason there are laws is because the ultimate lawgiver created the universe. We have a reason for trusting science. We have a reason for believing our observations. Science does not work in like ancient Greece. Because what if Zeus doesn't like you? He'll send a lightning bolt down and fry your lab mice in the middle of the night. It doesn't work in like, you know, ancient animistic sort of things. Because what if there really are fairies in the garden? And what if they really are mischievous? And what if you leave your test tube rack unattended for a couple hours? You can't trust that things were moved around on your rack. If you can't trust the universe, you have no science. I trust the universe because my God created it. Hebrews 11.3 by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's almost as if he's attacking naturalism right there. And yet, the universe still behaves naturalistically. I mean, when I go in science, I'm not expecting a miracle to happen. And when miracles happen, it's usually because I did something wrong. I uh, won't have a billion chance. Can it happen? No. No. What would I do wrong? It'd be like if you won the lottery ten times in a row. No, you're going to prison. It's a miracle. No, you're cheating. Those sorts of things aren't allowed. The universe was created. The universe also behaves naturalistically, except in the rare cases where God does something outside of the natural order that he created. And by the way, I'm using that word natural. That's a problem. Because that's invoking the name of a Roman deity, nature. But in English, I don't have another way to say something happens according to the laws of statistics, statistics and probability with no outside interference. That takes too long to say, so we just say natural. The laboratory is naturalistic. And yet, here's the problem. Naturalism is a wonderful science for the laboratory. It's a lousy science for explaining where we came from. And because it has such great laboratory success, the naturalists, that is, the people who have a philosophy of naturalism, as in nature is all that exists, they say, since it's such a great working thing in the laboratory, obviously naturalism is true. And they cut God out right there. But then they're left trying to defend ridiculous things like Big Bang Theory and the origin of life, the origin of consciousness, and the origin of the human intelligence. Ridiculous things, the origin of vision. Darwin said, he's talking about the origin of the eye. He says, start with the light sensitive spot. He said, start with a miracle. Vision, the shape of the eye is trivial compared to the ability of photosensitive molecules to detect photons without being utterly destroyed in the process. The fact that biology can detect light 
It's like catching a cannonball with a butterfly. That's not a joke. When a plant tries to photosynthesize, it doesn't just grab the photon. It grabs the photon and does a hot potato to another molecule, to another molecule, to another molecule. Because if it stays in that mo one molecule, it will burn it up. And every time you pass it off, it takes a little bit of energy. You pass it off a little bit of energy, it goes literally. Goes <laughs> they can measure how fast the photon goes through the photosensor. It's, it's in, I don't know, millions or billions of a second. And without all of those things ready, I mean, it's like a, I don't know how to explain it. Um, imagine you're, you're, you're playing hot potato with a bullet. And you grab the potato and you hand it to the next person at the speed of a bullet. That's what we're talking about. And if biology can't do that, then photosynthesis is never going to happen. And the evolutionists tell us that some of the earliest forms of life, in fact, the earliest forms of life that are detected were photosynthetic. Wow, the most improbable possible series of chemical reactions happen first. Right, let me give you a, a third definition of science. Imagine that science is just an interpretive filter of reality. Imagine it's just a way of thinking. And imagine reality is these vertical red bars. And your way of thinking is the gray bars. Can you see that even if your thinking is wonky, you can still get some things right. Can you see that? That's evolution. It absolutely gets some things right. It does. It makes predictions. Those predictions are true. You, you can't doubt that. But it doesn't mean it is right. It just means it gets some things right. And if we want to get into this evolution creation debate, we got to get outside of the easy questions. Do things change over time? Yeah, okay. Where did photosynthesis come from? Where did life come from? Where did the ability of DNA to, to make proteins come from? Those are the questions the evolutionists have to grapple with, but they don't want to. You know, I'm not claiming that my understanding of reality is perfectly aligned with reality. I wouldn't do that. But can you see that the closer you get your way of thinking to reality, the more you'll get right? And that's how science progresses. Naturalism, which was developed in Christian philosophy, which is a wonderful laboratory science, can go very far before it runs into headaches. They didn't know that in the 1800s when evolution came on the scene and they ran with it. Today we're seeing the problem. Today we're seeing that they made a giant mistake. Darwin thought life was simple. If life really was simple, evolution might be possible. Life is utterly complex. And the more we study it, the more we understand about the complexity. Let me ask you another question. What is natural selection? What is that? Is it magic? Is nature thinking? No. No one ever taught that nature was alive. Is it survival of the fittest? Now, Darwin was not happy with this phrase, natural selection. In fact, you ever read the, the whole book, The Origin of Species, according to natural selection. In a later book, um, Plants and Animals and Domestication, he, um, he said, yeah, that natural selection thing doesn't work. He actually discredited his own theory. People don't realize that. And he introduced things like sexual selection, kin selection, group selection, which the evolutionists have been arguing about for over 100 years now, because none of those systems really work very well. But natural selection itself, it's simply some things have more offspring than others, because some things fit their environment better than other things. Duh. That's a no-brainer. That's, that's nothing. Of course. But, no, not, I'm sorry, but I said out of order here. Natural selection as a phrase is awkward. Because it sounds like nature selecting. So I think it was Herbert Spencer who came up with the phrase survival of the fittest, which Darwin said, yeah, that's a good phrase too. But survival of the fittest is not a great phrase. Who's the most fit? The biggest? The strongest? The fastest? The smartest? The best eyesight? The quickest reflexes? Who's the most fit? By definition, it's the one with the most offspring. I mean, fitness is often misunderstood. I mean, consider that in World War II, 
The German units with the highest fight fatality rates was the SS. The fittest, the strongest, the smartest, the most aggressive males died like flies on the battlefield because they were aggressively stupid. Who got the girls after the war? The, the guys who you thought would have been less fit, the ones who weren't robust, the ones who were the baggage clerks, they all got married. All the manly guys are dead. So I'm just saying. Survival of the fittest is a difficult phrase. It's all about reproduction. Darwin couched all of his arguments, life or death. It's not about life or death. You don't have to die for natural selection to work. Consider, um, I, I wrote an article called Natural Selection in Paradise. It's on creation.com now. And I talked about natural selection working even before the world fell into sin and death. Imagine that there is a, a, a mountain, and on this mountain there's a species of oak tree. And the top of the mountain is really dry. And the bottom of the mountain is a river that's really swampy. <laughs> and within this oak tree population, there's various genes that allow some of the trees to tolerate wet roots and some of the trees to tolerate dry roots. And imagine that you know, elephants come through and they eat oak trees every once in a while. Maybe the average lifespan of an oak tree is 100 years. After a thousand years, 10 generations of oak trees, would you expect a lot of the genes for dry roots to be in a swampy area? No, because any tree who wants dry roots is not going to produce a lot of acorns. Would you expect a lot of genes for the wet roots to be up in the top of the mountain where it's dry? No, because any tree up there that wants wet roots is not going to produce a lot of acorns. It's about reproduction. And it's trivial. Consider this. Here's two bacteria. On the left, normal. On the right, mutant. The one on the left has a big old pore. So that green food can get in there, and the purple antibiotic can also get in. The guy on the right, he's got a small pore, so the antibiotic has a hard time getting in. He grows slowly, but oh, when you add antibiotics, the mutant degenerate bacterium lives. The normal, regular, healthy cell dies. This is a classic case of antibiotic resistance. Most antibiotic bacteria grow very slowly for various reasons. One of them, they often have defective pores, so we can't get the poison into the cell. But if we're selecting for a degenerate mutant that grows slowly and is defective, it's not what Darwin was talking about. But most of the cases for selection we've seen, that's, I mean, sickle cell anemia is a classic case of selection in humans. Sickle cell anemia, the highest frequency is in the Central Africa, where there's high, high abundance of malaria. If you have sickle cell anemia, if you're a carrier, your red blood cells, that the hemoglobin, under low oxygen conditions, it forms crystals. And it will change the shape of your red blood cells and get stuck in your joints and things. It's a painful, horrible disease. But because malaria parasites live in red blood cells, the sickle tends to tear the malaria apart. So it's better to be sick than to be dead. And if you're a carrier for sickle cell anemia, it's much more likely that you're going to survive to adulthood and have children, even though you're sick. So here we have two examples of natural selection working in the wrong direction. Natural selection doesn't work to explain origins at all. Let me give you a, a big idea here. I gave this to a conference. Michael B. he was at this conference. And he comes up after my talk and he asked me a question. As soon as he started talking, I realized I was wrong. And so I said, oh, wow, thank you so much. And I corrected myself. And he turns around and goes, I can't get that two-circle illustration out of my head. I was like, wow, yeah, Michael B. Anyway, I call this a two-worlds fallacy. Imagine that there is, I call this a two-worlds fallacy. Imagine that there's a world of evolution in blue and the world of creation in red. Is it true that every fact and factoid and little supporting evidence I find that fits an evolutionary theory disproves creation? The evolutionists certainly treat it that way. Is it true that everything I find that supports creation disproves evolution? No. Because of this. It's a zone of overlap. I call this non-discriminating information. 
It's information that both sides claim for their side, and therefore cannot be used to make a, di a distinction between them. But consider a high school uh, textbook. Natural selections change over time. This, that, the other, this, that, the other, this, that, the other. They give the student all of this information that fits both sides. But since it fits evolution, they say, therefore evolution is true. What a powerful way to argue. And that trips up so many young minds because it seems so clear. And yet, if you want to actually get into the debate, you have to get outside of the area of overlap, which is why I spent time talking about the origin of life and the complexity of life. Those are things naturalism fails dramatically at explaining. The fact that things change over time, okay, so what? Darwin's entire book, the book that changed the world, is irrelevant. In fact, it was hundreds of pages into that book before he finally said, I see no limit to the amount of change that natural selection can produce. You see? You imagine, Mr. Darwin? Yes, evolution in Darwin's mind was an imagination. He could see it happening. He didn't demonstrate anything. I can see purple elephants flying through the room, can't you? Imagination is not scientific testimony. And the world mis misunderstood what Darwin was doing. I think on purpose, but it's a long story. Have you ever seen this? The Miller-Urey experiment from the 1950s, where they took simple gases, ammonia, methane, water, or hydrogen, and they put it in water, and they boiled it, and they sent it through a, a spark chamber, zap, zap, zap. And then they cooled it off, and send it back into the boiling water again, and just let it go for a long time. You've seen that before? <coughs> when they sampled that tar at the bottom, they found building blocks of life. This is true. They found amino acids. Yup, they sure did. And the world proclaimed that the origin of life is trivial. Actually, what they showed was that random chemical reaction produced random chemicals. That's what they showed. Yes, they did get some amino acids, but they got a lot of amino acids that are not used in life, or probably millions of possible amino acids. And they got specific, they failed to get specific complex amino acids that organic chemists have a hard, really hard time synthesizing in the laboratory. And they never got long chains of molecules. You're made of long chain molecules. Chromosome one in your body is a foot long. One molecule is a foot long. You have long DNA, RNA, you have proteins, you have long chains of sugars, you have long chains of fats, you are made of very long molecules. Every single one of those molecules is linked, the subunits are linked, by removing H2O. OH from one end, H from the other, and they'll bond together. Now you have water. But that water can also go back in there in a reverse fashion and break the bond apart. If you took a pile of spaghetti and you put it in a pot, it would turn to sugar. Give it months, years. It'll turn to sugar. You take a handful of sugar, put it in a pot, it will never turn to spaghetti. It will never form long molecules. Yes, leave it in there long enough, sample it, you're gonna find a couple of sugars where you have two sugars bonded together. Very rarely you'll find three. In a vanishingly small proportion, you might find four sugars bonded together. The reaction can make this go the wrong way. Water destroys all of your precious biological molecules faster than they can form naturally. But so what? Um, in our Evolution's Achilles Heels documentary, we got Dr. John Sanford. He said the most profound thing, I'm going to paraphrase here. He basically said, I'll give the evolutionists all the proteins, all the DNA, all the fats, all the sugars. I'll give them cell membranes. I'll even give them millions of years they will never form life because life depends upon information. Life has a computer code on the DNA that controls it. It's incredibly complicated. So not only do they not have a source of organic molecules, they can't make polymers, they can't prevent the, prevent the polymers from decomposing. Oh, you have enzymes in your body that speed up reaction rates 
quadrillions of fold. There are certain chemical reactions, they will happen in nature, yeah, after a few million years, and your body does it like that. Without that reaction, you can't live. So what came first? The ability to make that chemical with that enzyme, or the chemical that never existed in nature because it formed too slowly. That was a chicken and egg problem. Besides all that, who cares? It's the instructions of life that's important. You have an amazing computer program inside of you called the genome. It is shockingly complicated. The evolutionists were saying for years they expected it to be simple. It's not simple. The whole rationale for the government spending $3 billion to sequence the first human genome, we're going to cure diseases. That was the rationale. You know the diseases they cured after they sequenced the genome 20 years ago? Zero. Because everything was a lot more complicated than they thought. They said, oh, the human body can make upwards of 300,000 proteins. We must have 300,000 genes. Now we have about 22,000. How do we make 300,000 proteins? Oh, it's because each gene is cut and spliced in a very complicated pattern. So that each cell type makes a different variant of the genes the other cell types are making. And some cells make this protein at this time and not another time. So it depends upon the fourth dimension, time. The genome gets really complicated. And without that, you can't live. All right, one more scientific illustration for you. Think of the smallest thing that you can see. There's a speck of dust floating in the air. What's the biggest thing that you can see and know how big it is? Not the moon, not the sun. You don't know how big they are because you don't know how far away they are. You can do a lot of calculating with a bunch of slide rules and strings and angles and a whole bunch of people. Yeah, and you, you might figure it out, but it'll still be very hard. You know how big your house is. You've lived in your house, you know every closet, every corner. You probably don't know how big your neighborhood is. Let's just spend a lot of time outside your concept. So if you lived on a mountain, you would not know how big that mountain is. You'd have an okay understanding of it, but you would know every tree and every cavity and every rock and every stream. You would know exactly how long it takes to get. You couldn't do that. That's about, okay, let's say you live on one mountain your whole life, that's as big as something you can possibly know for yourself. What's the shortest time frame that you can experience? Snap a finger, blink of an eye. That's about it, right? What's the longest time frame you can experience? Life. Life, exactly. Your personal life. Like maybe your dad or your mom planted a tree in the front yard when you were born and you've been watching this tree grow your entire life. That's all you can experience. Now, we've invented telescopes and microscopes and atomic clocks. So we've invented this thing called history, where we pulled all of human experience going back to, to the beginning of written records, which was only a few thousand years ago. And we've taken our zone of direct observation and expanded it into the zone of instrumentation and historical analysis. That's not where the evolution and creation debate is. It's outside of that. The scales are larger than that, and smaller than that, and shorter than that, and longer than that. And outside of what we can directly measure is just the realm of deductions. And that's what we're fighting. The secular world wants to make us think that, we, that the creationists, the people who believe the Bible, are, are Luddites, neophytes, Neanderthal brains, whatever, they insult us all the time, and they want to pretend that science is on their side. Science is supposed to be neutral. Most of science is on both of our sides, and the science that's not on their side is on our side, and a lot of it. Look at Isaiah 46.10. God speaking, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, but still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. How can God know the end from the beginning? Have you ever thought of that? I mean, if time is a line, right? You can't, you can't know the end from the beginning. You can't see both at the same time. You can know one or the other, or you can look at this and try to remember look over here. So imagine that God is a multi-dimensional being. We are trapped in four dimensions. Everything that God created is trapped in four dimensions. 
Even angels are trapped in time. Who are you? Have you come to torment us before our time? The demon said to Jesus. They are trapped in time. There's no parallel universes. There's no multi-dimensional uh, uh, multiverses. There's one. It's here. There's no guesswork. It's not like if I drop this water bottle, I'm going to cause a tsunami in Japan tomorrow. God already knows what's going to happen. There's only one timeline. One reason for that is, imagine that, imagine that God in multiple dimensions can take our timeline and do this. And he can collapse that dimension down to a single point. And if he, he is outside of time. Therefore, he can see all of time in an instant of time. The end and the beginning for God are the same time point. That's why he knows everything that's ever going to happen. He can see it all at once. We can't. We're stuck. One more cool sciencey thing. That's the ATP synthase motor. It's the world's smallest electric motor. You have gazillions of these in every one of your cells. All life depends upon these things. They are electric motors, but they don't use electrons. They run on protons, possibly charged particles. And they turn a thing, which turns a shaft, which takes these flappy things and opens them and closes them. And it takes this molecule called ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which is never found in nature because it's too reactive. And it bonds it with another molecule called phosphate, which is rarely found in nature because when phosphorus or phosphate hits a, um, a double charged positive metal ion like magnesium or iron, it forms an insoluble salt and precipitates out a solution. And living things can't break that bond. So phosphate is very rare in the world, which is why guano mining was so incredibly important leading up to World War II, which is why Florida has giant holes dug all over it. Because when they find phosphate, they dig it up, they grind it up, and they put it on a farmer's field up here. Phosphate's really important. This machine, which operates at nearly 100% efficiency, <coughs> requires ATP to manufacture. Lots of ATP. It takes ATP to maintain the DNA, transcribe the DNA into RNA to manufacture the polymerase that does that work, plus a total isomerase, gyrase, all the other accessory proteins. It takes ATP to charge the amino acid on the transfer RNA and to build it to transfer RNA. It takes ATP to move the ribosome and get all the, the things happening inside the ribosome. And yet, this is made of the things that it powers. Those proteins there require ATP to produce it. So now we're talking about a chicken and egg problem. We're talking like a spaghettification of the chicken and egg problem. We you have multiple things that all have to be true at the same time. It's like this. God creates a living thing. And he balances it chemically and he puts the ATP in there and he winds up all the little motors and he goes. And now you have living things. That is a sufficient cause for life. Random chemical reactions is not. Psalm 139, 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. When I consider what happens on the inside of me, I'm amazed. And the more I learn, the more amazed I am. Because God is simply amazing. I'm going to wrap up with a little bit of philosophy. This is Alvin Plantinger. He's a theist, at least. Interesting guy. He says a lot of things. He said, this is a long quote. Just follow me here. If you exclude the supernatural from science, then if the world or some phenomena within it are supernaturally caused, as most of most people believe, you won't be able to reach that truth scientifically. Observing methodological naturalism, thus hamstring science by precluding science from reaching what would be an enormously important truth about the world. 
It might be that just as a result of this constraint, even the best science, in the long run, <clears throat> will wind up with false conclusions. And the scientists pretend they know all the answers. There's a quote from Bill Provine. He said this while he was dying of brain cancer. He was a professor at Cornell. The end point of evolutionary naturalistic rationalizations. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. There's no ghost in his machine. He's just a machine. He's saying no free will. He's saying that the only reason we have thoughts and emotions and reactions is because those things are controlled by the genes we inherited from our monkey and fish ancestors, and those genes only help those ancestors reproduce and have babies. How do you work with that? This is a hopeless individual. This is a miserable individual. This is a person who's crying out for a better answer. He doesn't necessarily know it. He might turn away as he's presented with it. But we are facing hopeless people. People who have no answer for the turmoil that's happening to them, and they're not satisfied with the idea that they're just a machine. But that gives me great hope. Because once we can see this, and once we can understand the human condition, how tenuous life is, how ephemeral reality is, how great God is, and how people turn away from God, I think we might have some things to talk about if the conversation will ever get there. I tend to find the conversation that ended rather abruptly because they know where you're going way before you get there. So, who knows? Maybe we'll have some of these conversations tomorrow. Look, that was just one topic, and I did not do it justice. There are a lot more. Pick one. If you can ask me for a recommendation, I'm going to say, read your Bibles first. There's more answers there than most people want to acknowledge. Say after that, go to creation.com. I think we have 15 or 16,000 articles now. You can read forever. You're not going to run out of stuff to read. Pick up a book, pick up a, a DVD. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend Creation Magazine. Um, I'll talk more, more about this tomorrow. But Creation Magazine for me was, was one of the pivotal points of my life. I remember uh, John Morris and Ken Ham. Ken Ham worked at the Institute for Creation Research. He came to Waikiki Road Baptist Church in Atlanta. I was a freshman or sophomore at Georgia Tech. One of my friends drug me over there. I was barely a Christian. I was not a creationist. I thought these guys were crazy. Now I am that guy. I have so much more. There's Evolution's Achilles Heels, the book and the documentary. A lot of what we do is defensive. We, we try to defend our position and defend the Bible. We said, oh, forget that. Let's make the evolutionists defend their position. So we took a bunch of PhD scientists who read the Bible and said, okay, you're a total geek and a nerd, we know that. But Mr. Nerdy Guy, tell us, what can evolution not answer in your area of expertise? And they said some incredible things. We call them Evolution's Achilles Heels. Here's a brand new book uh, by me and Mike Ward, Biblical Geology 101. You understand where rocks and minerals come from and how the flood impacts the world? That's a good starting point. Here's a, another fairly new book by Mike. I, I actually edited this one, so I can give it a big thumbs up. The Deep Time Deception. Here's another one by Mike. How Noah's Flood Shaped Our Earth. Incredibly important topics. The Genesis Academy is a 12-part uh, lesson series in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We built a sound stage in our warehouse to film this. This is a two-year production. Uh, I gave, I think, three of these, but all the speakers we gave our talks to the other speakers like four times over the course of months. And every time we gave our talk, we got critiqued and we got shredded. And it hurt, but it made it better. 
We said, you know, if the enemy's going to be harsh with us, we might as well be harsh with each other because we got to polish us up, and that was one of the best things we've ever done. It's also pretty new. Here's um, Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb, this little kid's book about rocks and minerals, Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb, there's a bunch of other uh, kids' books on the tables. We also have a, um, a lot of our videos now are online. You can go to our streaming site. Here's the first one we released. It's actually totally free. The Historical Adam, Theological Considerations and Scientific conundrums. I think that's it. I forgot. Uh, this is me talking about why chromosomes, and where we came from, and the fact that we all go back to Adam. High tech cell is more um, technical stuff about the genome and how complicated it is. And I can compare the genome to a computer, and instantly, the computer is too complicated for us to understand. I'm going to leave you with First Peter three fifteen. In your hearts, honor Christ and more his holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. And I've seen a lot of that even today. I was way out of my element today. That was way out of my comfort zone. Hopefully tomorrow I'll come out of my little shell a little bit more. Um, I am a scientist. I like to sit in the corner and cackle at useless data. And oh, I drew a graph. <laughs> I actually don't like to talk to people. So this is good for me. Thank you guys for pushing me a lot. But we're engaging a world that is very confused. And we have better answers than they do. If you shout, of course, they're not going to listen. You know, harsh, sarcastic facts, you know, given to someone's anger, they don't usually point someone toward the kingdom. But even a, um, you know, I don't know the answer, but let's sit down and talk about this for a while. Here's a Bible. Let's read a little bit. Hey, hey, friend, come over here. You know what? Let's, let's talk to Joe here. He, he knows some stuff. <laughs> Those kind of conversations can be powerful. And we're practicing that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to be called your children. We do not deserve that. And yet you do it anyway, and we rejoice in that. Father, we know that we have not been good servants. We know we're lazy, sinful, distracted, and yet we also know that you're a good and loving God because you haven't thrown us to the side. Lord, we do wish to serve you. We do wish to get stronger spiritually. We do wish to be used by you to further your kingdom here on this earth. We're so weak, we're so tired, we're so sinful, and yet you can use us anyway. Please do that this week. Open our mouths, open our eyes, open our spiritual senses so that we can engage the, the spiritual battle that's raging around us and not be numb to it. Yet at the same time, protect us, Lord, so that we're not destroyed in the process, like a moth burning up in a flame. You're a good and loving and a wonderful God. We rejoice in you and what you've made. And help us rejoice as we go to sleep. Wake up tomorrow rejoicing even more and get out there and engage the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you all much. We'll be back here tomorrow at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock.